Ready? Good evening. I'd like to bring the, uh, to order the uh, February 5, 2018 Lake Washington School Board meeting. Don't adjust your sits. The, uh, I'm not Siri Bleasner. I'm Mark Stewart, your Vice President. I will uh, entertain a motion to approve the February 8 agenda. So um, moved. Well, hang on. Oh. Uh, so, so moved subject to removing the ER 23 science monitoring report from the agenda. Yeah. Okay, we got a second? Yes, second. second. Okay, it's been moved by Eric Liberty, seconded by Chris Carlson that we approve the agenda. All those in favor uh, signify by voting aye. 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 Opposed? Good. Uh, hearing none, motion carries. And as for our host school, uh, Dr. Pierce, would you like to introduce our host school this evening? Yes, thank you, Mark. We're so excited tonight to have Lake Washington PTSA Council here. And so our president, Liz Hedrine, is here. And in addition to the PTSA Council update, we're really pleased to have uh, our reflections uh, celebration this evening. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Liz. Welcome, Liz. Thanks for being here. Hi, is that okay? Um, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm Liz Hadreen. I'm president for the Lake Washington PTSA Council. Um, if you're not familiar what PTSA Council is, it's kind of, um, a council is a, a group of PTAs and our council is the Lake Washington School District. Um, and so it's kind of like a PTA board that's at the district level. Um, our mission is to be a relevant resource to our local PTAs and our families members and like all PTAs part of our mission is to advocate for the health and well-being and education of every child um, so I'm just going to give a little update about um, what it is that we do generally in a quick way and then just talk about some of the new programs that we have going on this year because we've got some great things that we're doing one of the big things that a council does is we support the 41 PTAs of the school district um, anyone who's been involved on a PTA knows that it's it's not actually easy being on a PTA, there's a, a lot to know. So the council board of directors is made up of experienced PTA leaders from around the district and we've all done our time at the local PTAs. And we come up to the council board and we provide support and training and mentorship to all of our PTAs. So if they're trying to you know, file their taxes and they don't know how, they call us up and we can help them. If they're trying to implement some kind of a program, they you know, need some support, they call us up and we help them. Um, so that's a big part of what we do. Um, we're also, I feel like in your local PTA is like this as well. Your local PTA is kind of a bridge between the parent group and the school administration. And I feel like our PTSA council is like a bridge between our PTAs and the families and the district um, in terms of communication going back and forth. And I feel like this year we've had a lot of great um, events where uh, the district leadership have come and talked to parents about choice schools and graduation requirements and they've been really well received and, and we really appreciate the support from the district because uh, parents are, you know, looking for information. Uh, we do a lot of programs that um, kind of make sense to do at a district-wide level like parent education or we do m monthly speakers for um, parents of kids with special needs. So rather than each school trying to implement that, we do it at the district level. And PTA is an advocacy organization. So we provide a lot of help to our PTAs on advocacy. We do a lot of advocacy ourselves. And I'll touch on a few of the advocacy programs we've done this year. So um, we have 41 PTAs in our council in the, in the school district. And we have two new uh, elementary schools in Redmond um, and we are already starting the process of creating two new PTAs at those two schools um, and um, we there's a whole process for doing that you have to have several meetings PTAs are actual legal corporations so there's all kinds of paperwork and stuff that needs to happen in order to become a PTA so the first step is um, an information meeting where there's a representative from Washington State PTA who comes to the community and talks to the parents and it's supposed to be a Q&A and a sharing of information and part of the meeting is supposed to be the parents deciding whether or not they, they want to have a PTA. So we held the meeting for the two Redmond schools on two different nights here and um, parents 
kept, you know, were coming in and kept coming in and coming in. And um, there was no discussion of whether or not there was going to be a PTA. I mean, everybody came in with, yes, we want a PTA. We ended up having over 50 parents at each meeting. And anyone who's ever been involved at, in PTA, to get 50 parents from one school community at a PTA meeting is like, it just never happens. So, you know, to me, it really showed the enthusiasm for PTA that these parents have. It shows that they've already had a really good experience with the benefits that PTA brings to their schools and their community. And I think they really were espousing the, the mission of PTA, which is, you know, to look out for all kids, their education and their well-being. So I was really, um, you know, I was really excited about that. Um, we have... 41 and soon to be 43 amazing PTAs in our district. We're really fortunate. And you know what? Not every school district can say that. Um, we have really talented and hardworking people. So, And I will just say another aspect to our success is the really good partnership we have with our administrators and the district and the staff um, because we really can't do it on our own. So that's a really key component. So thank you to all of you guys. Okay, so I'm just gonna highlight a couple of new things that we've done this year that we're excited about. We have two new family and community engagement vice presidents um, who've really just taken off this year and, and have done some great things. One is we had um, two events in October which we partnered with the district on um, to welcome new and international families because we'd gotten feedback that families come into our school district, and especially if they're from another country, and they really, you know, are unfamiliar with how things work. So we had these two great events with um, a lot of the leadership team from the district um, gave a lot of information. We had fun things like America 101, um, tips for relocating to the Northwest. It, it was a really, um, it was a really nice event. Um, the second thing that our family and community engagement VPs are putting together is a program called Life Beyond High School Adulting 101. Um, if any of you have um, high school students or high school children, uh, some of them are pretty clueless. And as a parent, I feel really lame because these are all the things that like we should be teaching them, but I don't know, somehow they just do not want to listen to their parents, surprise. So we're putting together um, just skills that kids are gonna need to know. And this is gonna be in March. It's on a leap day, so it's kind of an experimental thing, but um, just life skills for kids to learn. So that is coming up and we're kind of excited about that. Okay, advocacy, PTA is an advocacy organization. Um, I just wanted to touch on um, Melissa Stone, who's sitting back there, um, put together a really, um, professional candidates forum in October. Um, you might remember the 45th district race was very heated. And so, um, and we also had a, a school board race. Um, and uh, so Melissa worked really hard to put together a candidates forum. And after it was over, um, she got feedback from Jin Young England's campaign staff that it was one of the most professional candidates forums that they had been to that fall, which considering she must have gone to like a thousand, I, I think was really high praise. So, um, you know, that's the kind of thing that, that we do at council is um, this kind of information for our community. I don't know if you're familiar with these signs or have seen this or, you know, anyway, um, this is another big piece. And I really wanted it to just get bigger and bigger, but I couldn't make that happen. Um, this is a big piece of what we're doing this year is the bond and levy. And the PTAs are doing a great job in their schools. They're really kind of the backbone of the communication to the parents and the sign waving and, and everything that's going on. So we really appreciate um, our PTAs. Um, another thing I wanted to touch on, we've had special, we have a special needs group for our council. This year we have two chairs who are really reaching out to the individual PTAs and trying to get special needs chairs at the individual schools because um, every month they have a speaker and they have a parent group meeting and they do networking and they really want to, I mean there are like thousands of special needs kids in our district and we really want to bring those parents in together so they can meet each other and learn and and um, you know, do what they need to do to help their kids. Um, one last thing, um, 
scholarship program. Last year, we completely revamped our scholarship program, so I just wanted to give a little update on how that went. It went great. We had double the number, wait, sorry. Um, it went very well, we were pleased. Um, we had double the number of applicants that we'd had the year before, and one of the things that I'm excited about is our scholarships had always gone to kind of the 4.0 honor society, captain of the soccer team, kids, and those are great kids, but we also wanted to reach out to the kids who maybe you know struggled, had hardships, had obstacles. So we created two scholarships for those kinds of kids and had a lot of applicants, and their stories were very uh, touching. We really wanted to give all of our scholarships to those kids. Um, so, um, and we do have scholarships for staff, and you, that's, those are last year's winners. And I just want to uh, shout out to the Lake Washington Education Association, because they fund one of our scholarships every year, so they're generous. Um, and this year we've raised our amount to $1,250. It's been $1,000 for many years. Um, so that's just a little taste of what we're doing at Council. So thank you for your time. And uh, Reflections is one of our big programs. And that's my segue to Pam, who's going to do the Reflections program. Thank you very much. We'd now like to recognize our National Board Certified Teacher. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Pam Hay, and I'm the Council Reflections Chair, and I love supporting this program because I get to see how creative and talented our students are in our district, and I'm always amazed at their interpretation of the theme, and that year, this year it's within reach, and these are just some general things I've, I've taken away from artist statements. So we had about 1,200 students participate in our district, and uh, after judging at both the school level and the council level, we had 89 entries go on to the state level of the competition, which is happening right now. We should know the results of that in March. And our open house was very well attended, a very fun event. And I'm just gonna get right to it. We have uh, four students here tonight who are going to um, introduce their uh, entry. They are all award winners, which means their entries are now at state. And I'm gonna start with uh, Victoria, who won the Outstanding Interpretation Award in, for film. Hi, my name is Victoria, and I am in fifth grade at A.G. Bell. My project is the theme because the main character in my film cannot walk. She believes that walking is within reach. By the end of the movie, she achieves her goal. This project is dedicated to Miss Owen because a similar thing happened to her, and she is able to walk now. Thank you. gymnastics and ballet. But when I was nine years old, I was in a terrible car accident. I was taken straight to the AG hospital where the doctors discovered that I had a severe spinal injury causing paralysis. All my doctors said that I would never be able to walk again. My parents thought that I could. I pretty much listened to my parents. I also have an older sister named Grace. She is very kind to me. Well, anyway, so when I was in the hospital, they put me in a wheelchair and said to get used to it. I decided I didn't want to get used to it. I was doing physical therapy at least four hours a day. Most of the time, I would have fallen on my face if there were not people there to catch me. I had a special fourth grade teacher who came to teach me at the Children's Hospital during the time I was there. After about one year in the hospital, I was released. I waved goodbye to the nurses who took good care of me. I still had to go to physical therapy every day, of course, but soon I was able to walk with crutches. 
Then it was the end of July and I was turning 10 years old. I had a small birthday celebration with my family. Then my cousins came over and took turns riding in my old wheelchair. But soon it was September and I was starting fifth grade. I was so glad to see all my friends again. During the fall, the most amazing thing happened. I actually took my first step without anything to hold on to. On November 18, 2016, it was probably the best day of my young life. I actually walked across the shore entryway in my house. I know that doesn't seem very hard for you, but it actually hurt very bad for me. Ten days before Christmas, I learned how to walk all the way across my front yard. From then on, I only used my crutches on the bad days, and I donated my wheelchair back to the children's hospital. Fifth grade was the best year. Well, bye for now, because that was my story. Okay, now we're going to have Sophie Rose come up, and she wore the, won the Award of Excellence for her dance. Hello, my name is Sophie Rose O'Brien, and I'm in third grade, and I go to Emily Dickinson. My, my, vi my video is um, called Fruits of Labors. My work relates to the theme within reach because it shows a little poor hungry girl who only gets one meal a day. She sees an apple tree and wants the fruit. She's determined to reach the fruit. She keeps trying until she succeeds. She plants her own apple trees using the seeds from the apples for the whole village to eat so nobody will go hungry.
have Kenneth who won the Award of Excellence for his music composition. Hello everyone, my name is Kenneth Ma, I'm a junior at Redmond High School and my composition for this year's Reflections is titled Short Lived. With its relationship to this year's theme, my artist statement. In a literal sense, an object becomes within reach during your highest jump. In a figurative sense, an ideal comes within reach after many attempts. This piece reflects both applications such that the majority of it is made up of several such attempts until the climax where the object or ideal is attained. But after the highest jump, there is always the longest fall, after which the person breathes a sigh of relief and contentedness. And our last student tonight is Ahi, who won the Award of Merit, and she's going to read her literature piece. Hello and good evening, everyone. My name is Ahi Agrua. I'm a 2 by 3 quest student from Rosa Parks Elementary School. My reflection entry is about anti-bullying. If we always speak positive words, which is within our reach, we make this world a better place. Anti-bullying is within reach. Reach a hand, reach a friend. Be empathetic, reach a friend. Stop cyberbullying, reach a friend. Be kind, reach a friend. Be sorry, reach a friend. Be nice, reach a friend. Be courageous, reach a friend. Be cur courteous, reach a friend. Be compact. Be compassionate, reach a friend. Be considerate, reach a friend. Be generous, reach a friend. Be reliable, reach a hand. Uh, reach a friend. Reach a hand, reach a friend. Thank you. So we can have one more round of applause for our students. They did a great job. And um, we'll hopefully let them know in March how they did at state. That's it. Okay. Thank you all for sharing those uh, those great, great creative reflections with us. Those are fantastic. And to be able to perform in, in front of a crowd of folks that you haven't ever seen before in your life, that takes courage. And now to the part that I thought we were already at earlier. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to uh, would like to recognize our national board certified teachers. So I'll ask uh, Stephen Bryant to step forward and uh, make those presentations.
Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Stephen Bryan. I'm the Director of Professional Learning here in the district. And I'd like to thank our school board and superintendent for this opportunity to honor this year's National Board Certified Teachers. Created in 1987, the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards is an independent, nonpartisan, and nonprofit organization devoted to advancing the quality of teaching and learning. National Board certification consists of successful achievement of four components. The first component is an assessment of the teacher's content knowledge. The second component is a portfolio showing student work that has been done in the classroom and teacher feedback on that work. The third component is two videos of the teacher in the classroom showing lessons taught and the interactions with and among students. And the last um, component is a portfolio of a reflective work that the teacher does outside of the classroom that translates work from the classroom. The last three components are ac ac accessed, excuse me, assessed by a national panel of trained peers. Washington State and the Lake Washington School District continues to be a leader in increasing the number of national board certified teachers. Members, um, numbers released by the National Board of Professional Teaching Standards show that Washington has the most new national board certified teachers of any state this year. That's 1,434 teachers. The, the total number of 10,135 National Board Certified Teachers makes Washington State the third in the country overall. This year, Lake Washington School D District has 44 newly certified teachers that we will recognize today. This brings this count of Lake Washington School District Board Certified Teachers to 330, th 313, which is fifth in the state. Certification is a one to five year process. According to the National Boards, completing the certification shows that each teacher knows and practices the definitive standards of accomplished teaching. Chris Reichdell, the Superintendent of Public Instruction for Washington State says, it takes a lot of sustained and intentional work to become a National Board certified teacher. In, in addition, Governor Isley said, Washington's teachers are some of the finest in the country, and this additional certification will make a tremendous difference to their students, schools, and communities. I'd like to note that the success of our National Board Certification Program rests on a strong partnership with the Lake Washington Education Association. We are thankful for this partnership. We are very proud of our new National Board Certified Teachers and in addition, 17 National Board Certified Renewal Teachers that we'll also recognize this evening. We are pleased with this opportunity to recognize them for their hard work and achievement. At this point, I'd like to introduce Kathy Colombo, our lead National Board um, Facilitator. She's among several other facilitators that will read names of our newly certified and recertified teachers. We invite those that are in attendance to come forward and receive their district recognition. We also ask them to remain up front so that we can get a group photo of the event. Once again, congratulations to our newly certificated National Board teachers and our renewal teachers. Here's Kathy. Thank you. I want to introduce um, the other facilitators that are here tonight, which is Cynthia Cantwell. Kathy Fleming and Shannon Leonard and they're thank you so this is what we're going to ask you to do is when your name is called please come up and you're going to um, go all the way over to Stephen Bryant but you're going to pass by Kathy who's going to give you a little bling um, it's a national board certified um, pin that you can put on your lanyard and then after the picture We'll go out into the lobby and we'll give you your certificate from the district. So um, let's get started. Um, Eileen Barnes, Julie Bergevin, Trish Bergstrom, Jessica Butterfield, Karen Byman, Eric Carlson, Lua Car Carlson, Amy Chackel, Peter Chen, Sue Chin, Jackie Coons, Leslie Cordell, Liz Dunsire, am I going too fast? 
Um, Christine Everson, Heidi Friesen, William Gardner, Jeff Gehring, Casey Gehring, Carrie Hansen, Angie Casper, Kelly Kirkness, Jessica Lynn, Nadia Miranda, Patrick Monson, Emma Morris, Thomas Nash, Liesl Newbert, John Norris, Kim Oakley, I'm gonna just keep going so you guys work out the arrangement, okay? Gretchen Oates, Megan Palmer, Andrea Peoples, Alex Pike, Lindsay Quitmeyer, Shelby Rouge, Shauna Sandstrom, Nate Seberg, Allison Snetzler, thank you, I apologize from the bottom of my heart, Jordan Swain, Amy Teal, Sarah Ward, Macy Zwanzig, Ashley Zidell. These are all first time candidates. <laughs> Renewals, Kate Allender, Jamie Braun, Audrey Faulkner, Suzanne Hansen, Sandra Hoffman, Steve Hinden, Laura Dean, Marion Mays, Greg McDonald, Andrea Newell, Andrea Packer, Pete Saxby, Ruth Schemmel, Victoria Castaneda, Shannon Leonard, woo, Renee Levine. So congratulations. Well, everybody's finding their seats and deciding whether to stay or whether to go because they've got classes in the morning. I want to congratulate all, congratulate all of y'all who have gone that extra mile for your students. And in particular, I mean, you all wonder if some, some days if you've gotten through to any of the kids and you don't really know if your fruits of your labor are showing that day, but a few of them kind of take a little while to blossom. And one of the teachers tonight uh, was one of my son's teachers uh, and was teaching him photography. My son is a special needs student and he couldn't disseminate between all the pictures that he was facing. If you asked him, is there a tree in the picture? Is there this? He really couldn't say, but after his photography class, he started picking out, and for his uh, foods class this year, when he did his uh, uh, cookbook, he started arranging things as the way they should be by appearance. And that shows me that that teacher reached him. And thank you, Jordan. Yes, thanks all, and we are not offended if you get out of here because we know you've got an early morning. Exactly. I don't believe we have any public comment for the evening, but we do have proclamations. And I'm going to have uh, two, where, where my script go? There it is. Uh, I'm gonna have uh, Cassandra Sage read the proclamation for our CTE month, February through uh, the 1st through the 28th. Okay, proclamation. Whereas career and technical education offers students the opportunity to gain the academic, technical, and employability skills necessary for true career readiness, and whereas students in career and technical education programs participate in authentic, meaningful experiences that improve the quality of their education and increase student engagement and achievement, and whereas career and technical education provides students with career exploration opportunities earlier in their educational experience, which enables them to make informed and beneficial decisions about their academic coursework, as well as the pursuit of established programs of study and career paths, 
and whereas leaders from business and industry nationwide report increasing challenges related to the skills gap and connecting qualified professionals with available careers in critical and growing CTE-related fields, including healthcare, energy, advanced manufacturing, and information technology. And whereas career and technical education prepares students for these and other fulfilling careers by offering integrated programs of study that link secondary and post-secondary education and lead to the attainment of industry-recognized credentials, and whereas ensuring that employers have access to a qualified workforce is a crucial step in ensuring productivity among the business and industry communities, as well as continued American economic growth and global competitiveness, and whereas Lake Washington School District has approximately 6,373 students participating in 129 different career and technical education course options taught by 88 career and technical education teachers, therefore, the Board of Directors do hereby proclaim February 1st through the 28th, 2018 as Career and Technical Education Month in the Lake Washington School District. Signed by Dr. Tracy Pierce, Superintendent, and Siri Bliesner, Board President. Thank you, Cassandra. I'd also like to have at this point uh, Eric LaLiberty uh, read the proclamation on the National School Counseling Week, February 5 through 9. Whereas Lake Washington School District's 82 school counselors help students reach their full potential, and whereas school counselors are actively committed to helping students explore their abilities, strengths, interests, and talents, as these traits relate to career awareness and development, and whereas school counselors help parents focus on ways to further the educational, personal, and social growth of their children, and whereas school counselors work with teachers and other educators to help students explore their potential and set realistic goals for themselves, and whereas school counselors seek to identify and utilize community resources that can enhance complement and complement comprehensive school counseling programs and help students become productive members of society, and whereas comprehensive developmental school counseling programs are considered an integral part of the educational process that enables all students to achieve success in school. Therefore, the Board of Directors do hereby proclaim February 5 through 9, 2018 as school, National School Counseling Week in Lake Washington School District. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Cassandra. Yes make a quick comment here. I mean, we're really proud in Lake Washington of our career and technical education program and our teachers, as well as our counselors. And it's very timely tonight because later in the agenda, we have a program report that is uh, highlighting STEM and many of our STEM offerings are career and technical education courses. And then superintendent's report tonight is highlighting our student services uh, program, specifically how our counseling program works. So later in the program, uh, you'll get to see some more specifics about both of those programs and just kind of um, highlight what great work is really happening here in the district. So thank you both. Thank you I all. think it's also great to have both of those proclamations in the same month. They feed off each other, to be quite frank. Without great counselors, they wouldn't get into these opportunities and we'd lose a lot of kids and we can't afford to lose anyone these days. That said, uh, now it's on a monthly basis. The board of directors provides an opportunity for public comment during the board meetings. The board public comment period is a time reserved during our work meeting for the board to hear from the public. At this point, we haven't had anybody sign up. Do I see any volunteers that have all of a sudden had an inspiration to speak? Going once. We'll take just a moment and bring the podium. Oh, we're just going to have. Well, while we're doing that, if you like, here? I can read okay. the rest of this. Can you hear the rest of this? I don't need to. Let's see here. I was just trying to get the podium, but if you're going to just have her speak over here. Yeah. Okay. You technically do want to just talk about that, but you need to tell me. Okay. It's okay. Oh. I know, because it's not here. Okay. Um, I'm Liz Hedreen. I'm a parent at Lake Washington High School. Um, and I, my comment is it feels like there are different CTE opportunities for kids at different schools. 
and my understanding is that it's based on whether the teacher has a particular certification. So I think this is gonna be alleviated somewhat with the seven day period. Kids are gonna have more opportunities to take electives, but it feels like um, for some kids it's hard to get the CTE um, credit if they're taking um, music and, and a lot of academic classes. And I guess I'm always confused why things like chemistry and physics aren't CTE classes. It seems like that's a career and technical education. Um, but it does feel like it's not necessarily the same across the different high schools, and I'm not always convinced of the equity of that. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, let's look. Thank you, Liz. I appreciate all your comments on CTE, and I, I share your concern about the uh, having one class at one place and one at another and not having everyone being able to have the same opportunity. I um, want to remind folks, those of you who didn't show up tonight to speak to us, uh, there are multiple avenues in addition to public comment for community members to share comments, opinions, and or concerns with the board, including emails, calls, or letters. Please note that the public comment is not a question and answer session with the board, and the board and the superintendent will not respond to community members during the comment period, as our goal is to listen and learn from you. Uh, we basically have been able to, uh, with very few people, uh, wanting to participate this evening. I appreciate uh, the ones who have. Thank you, Liz. And also, I'd like to uh, remind you, please email us, call us, whatever method you want. We want to hear from you because if we don't hear from you, we don't know what your concerns are. And that's when a gap comes to widen between a community and the school board. And we don't want to see that. Uh, we'll go to our consent agenda. I now entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move approval. Second. Okay, we have, it's now been moved by Chris Carlson and seconded by Eric LaLiberty. Dr. Pierce, will you poll the board? Cassandra? Yes. Eric? Yes. Mark? Yes. Chris? Yes. Okay, Dr. Pierce, will you please review the donations? Please? Yes, this evening we have uh, one donation, one very generous and large donation to highlight. So just uh, so everyone knows, uh, donations of over $1,000 come to the board uh, for approval, and we read the donations as a way of highlighting and thanking uh, the group for making the donations. So this evening we have a $21,977.75 donation from Samantha Smith PTSA to Smith Elementary to provide student scholarships and stipends for accelerated math, accelerated reader, and read naturally after school clubs uh, to purchase accelerated reader and math licenses, also for library supplies, extracurricular supplies, classroom supplies, and to support assemblies and field trips. So uh, many after school and enrichment opportunities provided by that very generous donation. And we'd like to, I'd like to personally thank those that participated in the gathering of that money from Samantha Smith. And every day and every week, I know that each one of the PTSA says the same thing, and we appreciate every penny, down to the 75 cents, if you will. Uh, let's see. Uh, now for our non-consent agenda, uh, do we have any motions on the floor regarding that? Right, so we were moving that we postpone the discussion of ER23 science until Siri is back. Right, yes. Yep. Second. Okay. Uh, that is hard to strike. Yeah, for the no, agenda. Yeah. Okay. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. We will postpone that until uh, the meeting in which all the members of the board can be in attendance. Uh, it will, and we are also going to uh, provide a copy to staff before we yes. approve it. Minor detail. They'd like to also see what we are approving. <laughs> so sign it or something. Uh, let's see. Um, let's go on then to. Uh, let's go on to ER three. Our next item for the non-consent agenda is a board monitoring of board policy ER three internet interdisciplinary skills and attributes. Dr. Pierce. Great, thank you so much. So uh, this evening we have our final report in our series of end results monitoring reports. And it's kind of exciting tonight because it's, this is really the first time we've done a formal attempt at monitoring ER3, interdisciplinary skills and attributes. So uh, the board will remember a study session recently where uh, the board spent a lot of time discussing uh, how we can most effectively monitor interdisciplinary skills and attributes and what indicators we 
board wanted to look for. And so uh, we were able to produce a written report. Uh, this really is a baseline year. So where as some of the other monitoring reports have targets specified, uh, we did not get to the point yet where the board had specified targets. So this is our baseline year, kind of first attempt with this report, and uh, we still were able to take it through uh, from our lens and identify what we see as strengths and opportunities for growth in the data, and um, also uh, be clear about what current work is underway in this area and uh, what future planned efforts are also in play. So this report's a little bit different, although it does follow the same structure that uh, we have used for the previous ER monitoring reports. Uh, with that, uh, John and I are gonna uh, co-present here, and then when we get to the discussion part, uh, we can have the conversation between uh, the board and, and myself. So just as a reminder, uh, we are monitoring in ER3 academic thinking skills and strategies, communication and collaboration skills, local and global citizenship skills, and personal attributes. So these are those top areas of the student profile, and whereas the content areas, we have specific assessments in literacy and science and math, we don't have specific assessments or a particular you know, independent assessment for how we're measuring a student's personal attributes. However, we do have data that connects to other areas um, in the profile. So what we wanted to start with, and you'll see this in the written report as well, is those four main categories that are from the student profile, and then particular aspects aligned to each of those big categories where the board indicated the data is most connected. So part of the, part of the process here is to identify what data is readily available, and how does that data connect with particular areas of the student profile for example, if we look at the far right column, personal attributes. In that area of the student profile, there's specific indicators or a kind of criteria, I guess, would be another way of talking about those, but we're looking for ensuring and teaching students to take personal responsibility and to maintain balance. Those are life skills um, that are we categorize as personal attributes. So we place the indicators around avoiding at-risk behavior when it comes to uh, drug and alcohol uh, use, um, also the indicator of being physically active, the indicator for being involved uh, in school activities or athletics, those most connect to those personal attributes areas of the profile. So you'll see the indicators that the board agreed to, that this is the data that you wanted to see, and now we've just organized it uh, into the profile areas for clarity. So uh, we're gonna start with, if you go back one, one more slide, John. We'll start with the academic thinking skills and strategies and communication and collaboration skills. Now we're gonna present that part together because today the indicators really align with both of those. So looking at problem solving and if, if students are reporting that they, they can effectively uh, resolve disagreements and solve problems, um, as well as working well with others in terms of, um, again, handling disagreements, solving problems. Those are really the same indicators on the Healthy Youth Survey. So we've put that, those two, those two profile categories together. So what you'll see tonight is the uh, presentation in three parts. The first part focusing on academic thinking skills and strategies and communication and collaboration skills. And then the next part focused on global, excuse me, local and global citizenship skills. And then the third part uh, focused on personal attributes. And this follows the same organizational pattern from the written report that you received last week. So uh, overall, as we look at our data, uh, we do believe that reasonable progress is being made, although again, the board hasn't actually specified uh, a target for these areas yet. Um, and we do see that there's exceptions or opportunities in the data where we can improve. So uh, we will go through each area and highlight what we see are the strengths and what we see are the challenges or opportunities for improvement. So starting with academic thinking skills and strategies and communication and collaboration skills. Go ahead, John. Great. 
Uh, we, um, I'll just kind of start and then we'll, I'll have you chime in here as we go through. So what we did first is we identified based on the data where we see the strengths. And I'm not going to read all of these to you, uh, but these are the same uh, strengths that were called out in the, in the written report. So we do see overall that students are reporting that they and again, this is self-reported data from the Healthy Youth Survey, that they are reporting that they can handle disagreements and solve problems. We tend to see that those percentages are higher at the higher grade levels. We see that as a strength because that students' skill levels are increasing as they continue and progress throughout their school years. So uh, on the younger side, students are not reporting as high of percentages, although they are relatively high, and then those percentages continue to increase as they progress through the system. Uh, we are seeing that over time, the uh, students are reporting greater ability to do these things, so there's a positive trend. And we're not seeing significant gaps when we compare uh, the all-student group to uh, specific subgroups of students. So uh, we disaggregate the data for these indicators as, we, as the board discussed. We see some opportunities for growth and we'll highlight those, but overall we're not seeing significant gaps. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to John and he's gonna walk through some of the data displays that support our uh, assertions of strength here and then um, you can go on and talk about the challenges and I'll chime in as necessary. Okay, thanks John. Great, and so uh, here's an overall look at the four areas uh, in academic thinking skills and strategies and communication and collaboration skills, considering effects of decisions, empathy, handling disagreements and solving problems. And like Dr. Pierce said, um, like Washington students report that uh, they increasingly um, are able to uh, implement these in their daily lives. We also know that uh, same grade Lake Washington peers report similar, le similar levels of these social emotional learning skills and strategies over uh, the last two reporting periods. And these are reported at sixth grade, eighth grade, 10th grade, and 12th grade. And when looking at some exceptions in these data, um, the greatest exception we do see is really between gender. And you can see the top two data slides there, uh, effects of decisions and empathy. Uh, you do see a gap between, with females reporting, they have uh, higher uh, abilities in those areas or implementing those strategies at a higher rate. And then uh, down below, you can see there's a slight gap for handling disagreements and solving problems early on, but that gap really closes uh, by the time students are reaching 8th, 10th, and 12th grades. When looking at our uh, race and ethnicity data, um, we see that our uh, Latino Hispanic students are reporting that uh, uh, they are handling disagreements, solving problems, and considering effects of decisions um, at a lesser rate than uh, their peers. But we also know that the error rates uh, uh, the margin of error for our Latino Hispanic students in these data uh, is significant. And so we can't actually determine comparisons, but we know that uh, as the data plays out, this is how, uh, how it's reported. And so some of the things that we're doing in these areas, uh, current approach, uh, the integrated behavioral health supports, uh, we do have a contract with both Evergreen Health and Youth Eastside Services to provide uh, school-based behavioral health supports. Uh, our schools also have suicide prevention plans that uh, address many of these issues. Uh, strategies that are uh, being implemented now uh, our referrals network, we've worked with uh, Eastside Pathways to develop uh, really a contract around having uh, continuity of services for our students. Uh, previously, uh, a, a service agency would kind of one-off provide services for students, but this has really provided an opportunity where um, agencies like YES, Sound Mental Health, uh, the Asian Counseling Referral Services, and uh, Consejo uh, if they 
are providing services for a student, they work actually together collaboratively to provide services for any student at that school that uh, really qualifies for that service rather than having multiple agencies located at a school. And uh, curriculum wise, we did adopt second step for all of our uh, elementary schools. And then kind of strategies that we're looking at and working on, uh, the board has heard about SPERT, that's a screening brief intervention and referral to, that is the King County uh, grant program that best, uh, provided- Best Starts for Kids. Yes, Best Starts, best for, starts kids, for Kids, um, which uh, provided funding for all of our middle schools to really have a planning year and the district will apply for an implementation grant uh, moving forward. And right now, uh, we're also looking at middle school social emotional learning curriculum uh, knowing that that's a need at our middle level as well. Okay, I'm gonna start us off with um, the, the next section. So local global citizenship skills. Uh, really this, this whole concept of civic responsibility is uh, what falls into this category um, of, uh, um, sorry, it, it fills in, uh, um, into this category of local and global citizenship skills on the profile. You'll recall when we uh, had this discussion, there's a lot in there about exhibiting, um, you know, it, it's sort of what, thing, stu what students would learn in a civics class, right? Now we don't have a civics assessment or anything like that, but what we do have is ways to measure their own uh, responsibility in terms of avoiding certain behaviors, right? Like avoiding, chronic absenteeism, so the responsibility of coming to school and participating in school, or uh, avoiding behaviors that are resulting in discipline. So the sort of civic responsibility of being a good citizen at school and avoiding behaviors <coughs> that result in, in discipline. So that's where the connection here is. So the two indicators in, in uh, this portion are really those two that the board indicated that they wanted to look at, chronic absenteeism and suspension expulsion rates. So uh, when we look at our data, uh, overall it's uh, very strong. Uh, when we look at how we compare with other districts, we rank fourth in, and second, uh, you'll see the data here in a moment, in avoiding chronic absenteeism and exclusionary discipline. Meaning that we have, uh, again, we framed these for the report as in terms of avoiding those. When you look at the state data, it's all about um, having a low chronic absenteeism rate is a positive. Having a low exclusionary discipline rate is a positive. And so that's what we see, although we framed them in the positives here, so the numbers are high, which again is a good thing. Uh, we also, again, look at disaggregated data, and there's uh, areas of strength and there's areas of opportunity, so we'll point out both of those in terms of strength. Um, our special education students rank in terms of exclusionary uh, discipline is fifth, amongst the 49 comparable districts, and we're on a positive four-year trend. So that's a good strength. Uh, when we look at all the different race and ethnicity student groups, uh, every group is having a positive trend for avoiding exclusionary discipline, and the ranks uh, when looking at com comparable districts are between three and five. Um, so those, those are positives, those are good things. And we, when we look at our ELL student group, we're not seeing a, a gap in avoidance of exclusionary discipline, and uh, a, the rank for that student group is four, and there's a positive five-year trend. Now, we'll also point out some areas of uh, opportunity when we get to that point, but these are really the strengths that we see when we look at avoiding chronic absenteeism and avoiding exclusionary discipline. So I'll hand it over to John. He'll walk us through some of the data slides and then uh, can take it from there. And like Dr. Pierce said, uh, we have framed these in the positive, and so uh, we're not reporting here that 91% of our students are chronically absent. Um, we're actually reporting that 91.2 of our uh, students have avoided chronic absenteeism, and chronic absenteeism is defined as 10%, missing 10% of school um, and or missing two or more days of school per month. Uh, and so you can see that uh, Lake Washington students consistently perform similar or better uh, than peers in comparable districts in avoiding chronic absenteeism and exclusionary discipline. 
I wanted to point out uh, in these slides, you can see that when looking at uh, some of our groups, that all of our students are uh, demonstrating a positive trend in uh, avoiding exclusionary discipline. And then looking at some of the exceptions in the data, you're going to see some of the similar uh, data slides that you just saw because while on the left there um, are students receiving special education services, while there's a positive um, uh, growth in avoidance of exclusionary discipline, we still see a gap uh, over that those five years. Uh, you can see that that gap is reducing over time, but there still is a gap. Um, additionally, on the right-hand side, uh, you can see that uh, the avoidance of chronic absenteeism has remained constant over the, the data periods, with the gap remaining constant as well, and that's a, a point of, uh, of concern for us. When looking at our low-income students, you can see a similar data trend uh, with a growth rate uh, over the five-year period a consistent gap for both exclusionary dis discipline and avoiding chronic absenteeism. And then when looking at our students receiving ELL services, uh, as Dr. Pierce reported, there isn't a gap in uh, avoiding chronic absenteeism, meaning the rate for students receiving ELL services is the same or similar to the all student category, but in terms of avoiding chronic absenteeism, you can see there's um, a bit of a gap over time with the last data period actually having a larger gap. And again, these are the same data slides you saw just a minute ago. Positive trends for uh, all of our student groups uh, in regards to race and ethnicity uh, over the last five years, but our uh, black African American and Latino Hispanic students uh, ha are experiencing more exclusionary discipline than their peers, and there remains a gap. A similar gap is there for those same student groups in regards to avoiding chronic absenteeism. Uh, you can also see on the right-hand side, um, looking at our uh, Asian student group, that they've actually seen a decrease in avoidance in chronic absenteeism over the last five years. So some of the things we're doing, um, I'm actually going to, um, in this first bullet point uh, around our SIP process, I'm going to talk about current and strategies being reviewed or evaluated. Currently, uh, all of our schools set school level goals for discipline and attendance. As we're thinking about really trying to address these data that we're talking about, if you go to the far right, what we're discussing is, does it make more sense to have all schools set uh, school level goals around chronic absenteeism and avoiding exclusionary discipline? So being really tactical about if this, these are the outcomes we're looking at, do our, are our schools actually looking at the same things in their continuous improvement process plans? And then back to the left, uh, we did a very robust attendance awareness campaign this year with posters, social media, videos, uh, just talking about the importance of attendance, being at school, and uh, actually showing our Lake Washington students in all of those uh, campaign efforts. Um, In-school suspension, uh, keeping kids at school if they do need uh, to receive an exclusionary discipline, keeping that discipline at school uh, to the greatest extent possible allows us to keep them engaged academically to provide uh, support as needed um, when they're there. And then as far as referral services for students, um, having uh, prevention specialists on campus um, also allows us to react and respond when a student uh, is suspected of um, abusing drugs or alcohol. Uh, in the center column, there are new strategies. Uh, if you uh, think about the data we just saw, we saw positive five-year trends for avoiding exclusionary discipline and really kind of static data uh, across the board for uh, uh, avoiding chronic absenteeism 
uh, there wasn't a lot of movement in the data. And so things like our community truancy boards, that is uh, a step before a student going to uh, court in regards to their truant behavior. And the community truancy board really is almost like a wraparound, really trying to understand the student's needs, the family's needs, and uh, providing a different level of accountability prior to that next step. Uh, the WARNS assessment, it's a requirement of Washington State. Uh, we have to get approval from parents to be able to conduct this assessment, but this assessment can help us to identify uh, whether a student is at risk of truancy uh, when they're having challenges, and then uh, additionally, the, the adoption of the second step materials for elementary also helps to support these areas. Again, I spoke to those uh, uh, two items under the SIP plans, uh, and then we're also starting to use Power BI with our exclusionary discipline and our chronic absenteeism data to understand it uh, in more real time. Okay, then the final section on personal attributes, again, focuses on uh, maintaining balance and uh, taking personal responsibility, which we have uh, connected to avoiding uh, risky behaviors in terms of drug and alcohol, and also uh, participating in physical activity, athletics, and activities. So those are the indicators that you'll see reported here. Overall, and I think we have a typo that I'm noticing, but you can help me if I'm looking at this incorrectly. So when we look at the data, the trend data does show uh, that there's increases in students avoiding harmful substances. So when we look, and you'll see the data slides here in a minute, um, for six, sixth graders since 2010, uh, eighth graders since 2010, that's a positive. I think the second bullet, and this is my mistake, I think it should say students avoiding substance abuse has increased since 2010 because if it decreased, that would be a bad thing. So just excuse the typo there and we'll fix that on the second bullet. And you'll see the data in just a moment. Um, you'll see also that 90% uh, or more of our grade 12 students report avoiding cigarettes or other illegal drugs. Um, it's the highest avoidance rate for this age group. Uh, there's some other issues that we'll point out again. Uh, also, when we look at participation in district athletic programs, nearly a third of our high school students participate. We see that as a strength. Uh, we do see students reporting similar levels of participation in physical activity since 2010, so that's not an area that's decreasing. We see that as a strength, still opportunity there. And um, also students are reporting similar uh, levels of participation in uh, activities. So again, one is physical activity and one is uh, activities such as um, activities and clubs that would happen after school. So you'll see the data here. Uh, and we'll walk through uh, both the data that supports the strengths and then the data that uh, reveals some opportunities. And so uh, looking at these data, uh, just to orient you again to what you're looking at, this is uh, looking at each of those areas from sixth grade to 12th grade. So this isn't sixth grade in, in different years participation, but it's actually um, sixth grade student avoidance of alcohol, eighth grade avoidance of alcohol. And so um, that's what you're looking at here. And so just to point out a few items here, uh, more than 90% of Lake Washington students avoid cigarettes and other illegal drugs at all grades. Um, younger, younger students report greater avoidance of harmful substances uh, than older Lake Washington peers, and students report less avoidance of alcohol compared to all other harmful substances. So it, while that's not a positive, it's uh, something that the data does point out. And just again, you'll see later, you know, with, that, with all of these where we can point out strength, there's also the inverse <laughs> and some opportunity or weakness in the data too that'll come up later. And so, like Dr. Pierce uh, pointed out a minute ago, um, Lake Washington students do report higher avoidance of harm harmful substances as compared to uh, 2010. And so since then, uh, there's been f uh, three uh, data cycles, and so you can see, uh, in general, there's been uh, positive trends. 
when looking at both physical activity on the left and participating in activities on the, on the right, under physical activity, Lake Washington students report higher rates of physical activity at younger ages, and the reporting of physical activity has really remained constant over the last four years for the different age groups. And uh, in regards to participate in, participating in activities, our sixth grade students report the highest level of participation in activities. And it's interesting that our grade eight students actually report uh, the lowest on average participating in activities. So just something for, for us to, uh, to note. Thinking about exceptions, uh, again, we have a gender uh, difference. Uh, that I'll point out here on the left, uh, it's physical activity of five days or more per week, and our male students are reporting higher levels of physical activity than female students, with grade 12 showing the largest gap. And in participating in activities, our females actually are participating uh, at a higher rate than our males, and the gap really is consistent across all grades. When looking at uh, race and ethnicity uh, data uh, in regards to physical activity of five days or more per week, uh, you can see that a gap does exist between our white students and our other uh, race ethnicity groups being reported, and our Asian students report the lowest level of physical activity at both grades 10 and 12. And when looking at participating in activities, uh, there's a gap between our Asian students uh, and our other student groups, with our Asian students reporting the highest level of participation in activities, and our Latino Hispanic students reporting the lowest level of participation. Again, we also look at the margin of error for these data points, which uh, uh, doesn't allow us to have true comparisons, but wanted to uh, point that data out. So what do we do around these areas? Uh, we know our elementary students receive two 30-minute PE sessions per week. Uh, they have between 45 and 60 minutes of recess daily. Um, our secondary schools, they have uh, health as part of their curriculum um, and with our uh, middle schoolers taking one semester of health, high schoolers earning half of a credit. We have uh, YES counselors, uh, assigned to our schools to provide support. Uh, all of our secondary schools offer athletics and activities for students, and our comprehensive high schools have established athletic equity teams. That's a team made up of school administrators, staff, students, and parents to really review all aspects of uh, equitable opportunities for males and females in terms of sports and athletics. Uh, strategies being implemented. Uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier in the study session. The issue of vaping um, is something that we really are trying to figure out right now because not only um, is it determining options for monitoring and responding, it's actually uh, uh, being able to identify when students have a device um, that would lead to vaping. Uh, at the middle level, we're continuing the middle school athletic uh, review uh, to- Do Dr. Holman. I have to profess my ignorance. Um, is, is vaping uh, marijuana? So or is it, is it, is it tobacco? Is it both? I, uh, it's, it could be either or okay. both. It could be either because the, the, the device, I, I, there's like non, there's sort of um, like nicotine based mm -hmm substance or whatever that you can put in there and or you could also vape marijuana based substances as well okay uh, e-cigarettes is another term for these types of devices do we happen to know what is the most prevalent i do not are you asking in terms of our student use sorry yes if someone is found to have a vaping device? Is there some kind of dipstick test we can do and see what, it, what they're actually using, or how does that work? 
it's just turned over to the police or right I, I think it would be best for us to follow up yeah okay uh, I'm just curious the consequence yeah. would be the same so if, if a student were vaping mm -hmm. a nicotine based substance the consequence would sure. be the same as smoking a I'm cigarette just, right and right. if they were vaping a marijuana based substance the consequence would be the same as if they were smoking marijuana sure. out of a different I'm, device I'm looking but at it more of a health concern sure. kind right, of right. just curious mm -hmm. and and it, I think in that that's a great question and one that we'll follow up on in terms of how can it how can the administrator <laughs> tell what's right. actually being vaped right yeah thanks thank you for those questions um, in, terms, in terms of strategies being uh, reviewed or evaluated, uh, we did just implement a new sport for uh, our females at the high school level with slow pitch softball. And uh, currently looking at doing a survey regarding activities to really start to understand what students are looking for, interested in, and participating in so that we can support that and build those activities and programs for students. Can I ask one more question about the chronic absenteeism? Is that unexcused absences or any absence to in a month? And that was actually a question that I remembering you raised in the study as well, and we're going to loop back on that. We're just trying okay. to um, differentiate if it's excused or unexcused or if and, it's just absent. And if you could educate me when you get a chance as to what the difference is on when it is excused, how how it becomes excused, or right. what's the criteria for being excused, yeah, I guess, is right. my question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. So with, um, with, with ER3, I know Eric is the uh, lucky one, right, <laughs> who gets to uh, take the lead on the assertion report. And this one's a little trickier because we don't really have established uh, targets. Uh, however, this will be the time where the board could take a few moments to uh, either ask any other clarifying questions of, of me uh, and then just have a little time for any uh, board reflection that would uh, be a precursor to what then the board would send to Eric so Eric could complete the uh, assertion form which would then come back and just for the benefit of everybody who's here then it, that's the board's opportunity to say these the, these are the priority areas uh, we would like you to focus on for this particular area so with that I'll just uh, turn it over to back to you mark to uh, for the discussion well let me begin it <clears throat> with the comments I recall as we had this discussion the last time around that the issue of uh, student after school workers um, really isn't factored into this and I'd like to in the future as we're looking at it uh, because that is a composition of, of talking about their uh, civic involvement it talks about the responsibility of getting to work on time uh, the responsibility of holding a job and also then balancing that with their academics so as we go in this process, and I know this is a baseline, so that's why I'm hoping that we can really look at some other angles to include in it, because that has an impact on whether or not you're going to participate in extracurriculars. I know I went to work at 14, and I didn't have time for a whole lot of curriculars, including the extras. So um, I'd like to suggest that we could, if we can round it out, and I don't know if there's a way to, to be quite frank, to gather the data. I don't know how, but I'm asking the question. Are there any other comments from any other board members? I'd just like to say that I'm really glad to hear that we're asking students what it is that they're looking for in activities and the legal ones I'm talking about right now, all the ones that we can offer, um, and making sure that we're trying to offer what that particular community is seeking. So. Um Thank you, John. That was great. Uh, there, there, was, there are no targets uh, in our uh, right now because we haven't set them yet. I, I guess my question, Tracy, is when, um, when do you think we, the staff will put together potential targets for the board to review and approve? Yeah, so, so actually that, that would be um, a board conversation. So on that one, I mean, there's well, there's two ways. And it's interesting because the, our approach, um, I'm glad you're raising them. So I think we should 
have that conversation further because when uh, the board had the discussion at the extended study session last March around uh, the other ERs, uh, the board came up with what those targets were there. Mm -hmm. Now at our January study session, there was some, uh, with the facilitated study session with the facilitator, there was some dialogue there that uh, it would I came away with maybe there's a, a different way that staff would set those targets. And so I think it can be done different ways. And so I would need some direction from the board, right? Does the board want to set the targets for ER3 like you set the targets for the other ERs? Or would you like uh, me to come with a proposal of targets? I'm happy to do either. Uh, well, I, I mean, I think that whether the board I mean, it's, I guess the question is who's going to generate the proposed, the proposed targets. I mean, ultimately the board's going to approve it one way or another. I mean, my, my take is that for something like this where we are inventing it out of whole cloth, uh, it makes more sense for staff to come to the board with a proposal rather than the board trying to generate something on its own. I might, su I might suggest that it be a couple of proposals that way and also the background for why to go to level X as opposed to level Y, uh, what's the, uh, uh, the rationale, and also what's the uh, research to back it up of why this one's more important than the other. And I think that'll also give us the opportunity to say, these are great, what about this also? And maybe we can have some input at that end after we see what it is that staff comes up with as far as the structure goes, and then if we see something that, oh, that reminds me, this might be a great target also. Have and input at a later time. So just to be clear on that, Cassandra, are you talking about the indicators or the targets? Because Mark, uh, and there was a lot of uh, conversation about potential additional indicators at the study session, like the one you just raised around students who work and so forth, and then the question becomes is that, you know, how do we go about getting that data and so forth. So, uh, I mean, we can do both. I think there's both the potential of there being additional indicators mm -hmm. that the board would like to see, and then it's like, what's the target? Is it, you know, 95% and X, you know, comparable to other districts and, pro you know, I think in the increasing progress. Those right. are really the indicators for the other areas. Leaving that door open okay. for both, mm -hmm. not in a major gutting way, but in, <coughs> oh, right. this brings to mind, we could also use this, and what would the logical target be? Right. If we can just leave that open so staff or uh, the board can also yeah. have some input. So part of what's been baked into the new process that we're using this year is for those indicators uh, to be, it, for example, after we did literacy, I know there was some uh, dialogue from the board around, we'd also like to see these as potential indicators. So then if that became part of that final uh, assertion form, then that's gonna mean next time around Year, next year when we do the ER report, those would then, those indicators that the board said we would like to see will get reflected in the next generation of the reports. So, so part of what I think in, as you're collecting input from the board and the board's deciding this is what the final is, that some of, some of the indicator uh, ideas uh, for additional ones comes into that process. On the indicators, I can see how the out of school, after school work might be a problem together. Uh, I would like to see us have more data or together data as an indicator on peer yeah. tutors. And Chris, I see we Chris can do that for you. John, could you come back up here and. and Actually, I, the, the reason I'm doing it is because I got I want to flip back and forth between a couple of slides, and it's a lot easier for me to, than, to do it here than by remote control. Can, but can I really I want to one show thing you to guys tie something. Off what yeah. Mark was talking about, um, and Tracy. So yeah. for the. Additional indicators, we discussed a number of them at our last study session. Uh, Siri did a great job of taking all of them down and sent them to me. Uh, I'm going to include them in the draft uh, right. Right. report that we send out, and we can, if people have strong feelings about excluding or, or bumping those up, um, I'll note that in the report. But because I, 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 I'll, be, I'll be honest, I'm not remembering any of the ones that I said last time now. I hear that. Uh, and I want to report that anecdotally, what I've seen over the last couple of years with peer tutors 
is that often uh, kids will be suggested to become peer tutors to help their attendance level. And I have seen attendance levels boom when those kids are getting involved when, with special needs kids and so forth, because all of a sudden those kids come alive. Mm -hmm. And they have a purpose for being in school other than just sitting in a chair. Mm -hmm. I think she just Chris. So I, I wanted to, this is the first time we've seen this, but actually what's beautiful about it is that we've got one piece of this that our junior aware of as a long-term focus, and that's the uh, exclusionary discipline. That is, for the few years now, we've been working on the uh, in-school suspension model, and when I saw this slide, I'm not interested in telling you what the number needs to be. I'm interested in asking you to make the shape of the curve look like this. For the last four years, we've been looking at in-school suspensions, and we're shifting the needle on exclusionary discipline across all groups towards less exclusionary discipline. This is the sort of thing that's success. The absolute number doesn't mean much to me, but the fact that all groups are going up. The gaps are still something I worry about. But so from, the, from your question about who sets the standards uh, or who sets the targets, I'm happy to let you set the number targets, but this is what I'm looking for. When we're trying to move the needle on something, I really like to see this. And it's not something that happens in one year. This is something that's taken a sustained effort, and it has moved the needle substantially. Um, it, so that made me very happy. Now, when you look at something like this, and the assertion is that uh, you know we're consistently performing better than peers, well, we don't actually see that on this graph. And the you know the chronic absenteeism is about as flat of a line as one can draw. Um, I mean, it goes up from 90 and a half to 91.3, down to 90.7, up to 91.2. I mean, this is a flat line. Mm -hmm. The where that flat line is is not something I'm that interested in. I'm more interested in, is it moving towards where we want it to be? And so um, that piece of it, that, and this is something that's hard for me. When we're trying to set goals with you, mm -hmm. are we setting goals for next year, which gives us a short-termist outlook? Or are we saying, look, this is an area where we really want to see you move the needle. And again, it's policy governance. We don't care how you move the needle. We just want to see a significant trend going in the right direction for those really important dimensions. Right. And it's interesting because, and again, this would be you know, further conversation we could have in, in March as we're uh, looking at the ERs again and potentially the ELs. Uh, but that was sort of the approach for uh, ER2, when we had that conversation, I remember last year in March, there was wanting to set a, a high uh, um, aspirational target, and that's where the 95% came. And I remember very clearly Chris saying, it's not so much that I care if it's 94%, or, but are we trending in the right direction? Mm -hmm. And there was that interest in, are we um, out of sync somehow in a good way or a bad way um, when we look at other districts across the state. So really what we landed on was a threefold performance target where we look at the aspirational goal of 95% in all areas, uh, the uh, comparability yep. to uh, districts, lar other districts in Washington, and then the third prong of that is trending in, the, mm -hmm. in a positive direction. So, you know, that may be a similar approach that you want to put to, to this yeah. report as well. Um, so it's not so much about the absolute number just in and of itself. Right. Because, again, it's not looking just year to year independently. It's looking over right. time. And, mm -hmm. and really that I find the most satisfying piece is when things really move. It, the other place I saw this and had a, it wasn't a eureka moment, it was just a yes, go, go, was the uh, KISN, the Kindergarten Intensive Safety Net. That moved the needle, and it moved it over the course of a few years, but it moved the needle dramatically. And that's really, to me, we're good, but that's going from good to great. Um, so with that said, I really do feel like there's a place to start. I'm happy to talk about them. Now I want to... There's one thing that I, I know you're trying, this is the first time you've done it, um, but slide 12, I couldn't figure out how these connect to the gaps. 
or to the things that we're looking at in terms of academic thinking skills. So the, the 12 is the approaches, the integrated behavioral health support, suicide prevention plans. Suicide prevention is, I, I'm not against it, but how does that connect to academic thinking skills and strategies? Right. So this was the one where I really felt the greatest disconnect between okay. what we're trying to do. Just because we just because we say it's important doesn't mean you have to say there's something new. Mm -hmm. If you've got something as a current approach, mm -hmm. it might be right. we're still implementing that. Right. So let me speak to that. So the indicator, so we were, we were having a, a dialogue at the last study session about connecting the dots between the profile area, in this case academic thinking skills and strategies and communication collaboration skills, with the data, in, the indicators that we have readily available from healthy youth, mm -hmm. and where do we think it connects with what we mean by communication and collaboration skills, what we mean by academic thinking skills and strategies. Yeah. There's one component, I'll call them components. If you look at the profile under academic thinking skills and strategies about solving problems effectively, and there's one component connected with communication of, and collaboration skills about working well with others. When you look at the indicator in terms of percent of students who know how to handle disagreements, solve problems, consider effects of decisions, and be empathetic, that seemed, that's where it connected most to, you know, so it's a little bit of a. I know. Do, it, you know what I mean? Right. It, it, and so that's, this is one where it's yeah. awkward because mm -hmm. when you, because it, most of what you measured and presented is about communication and collaboration skills. It wasn't mm -hmm. necessarily about academic thinking skills and strategies. Right. It, Although pro it was you, you really can. Yeah. honing in on the solving problems effectively. Right. Right. A and so, mm -hmm. it, so it's just the connect and just to kind of connect the dots here. So part of in um, part of what if students are having difficulty solving problems effectively, there's supports for them at school through counselors. So if I'm having problems that I don't know how to solve, mm -hmm. um, that and maybe I'm having problems with my peers, or I'm making decisions that are affecting me negatively, who can help me at school? Uh, who can help kids at school are really our um, social workers through Evergreen Health, our, our counseling staff, our YES counselors. So that's just, just to help. It might not be the best connection, but I just oh, want no. to understand why I, I, these are here. And, and this, is, th this is why I wanted to mention it right now in the mm -hmm. round so that we could get the feedback on, because I, I, I actually see it now, but I need a piece of this presentation that's reframing the problem from the sort of the aspirational vision statement mm -hmm. to the here's what we can measure and here's how we're sort of defining mm -hmm. right. what is being measured within that component. Mm -hmm. So breaking out the components would be useful. Um, okay, and so yeah, and again, I you know, first time out, it's always gonna yeah. be, there's a lot. Oh, but no, there that's, are always gonna be glitches. And it's, yeah, so. so in the written report and in the beginning part, that was, that's why I took the yeah. indicators and tried to backward map them <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> into, because the board came to agreement on what the indicators are, but just trying to, you know, like I said, connect those dots to right. what's there. Yeah. Anyway, good, so, good feedback, this is helpful. And in terms of glitches, glitches happen, the previous slide um, I don't know why there's only, there's four point data points for the top category, there's three data points for the second, there's two data points for the third, and there's one data point for the fourth. These, these graphs have a problem behind but the But it's scenes. the end size, right, of the group? But so is that what you're referring to? Because when it becomes uh, under 10, it's personally identifiable I, and not yeah, reported. Yeah, the solved problems, the bottom right corner, Asians have a data point in 12th grade. The top right, oh, whites gotcha. have a data point. Mm -hmm. What yeah. what gives? Why what happens with the point? healthy youth survey is that we have fewer students uh, actually taking the survey in 12th grade. Yeah. So uh, you know we encourage students to take, uh, but we do have well, better participation in the younger grades than the older grades. Speaking of someone who's a professional at sniffing out real interesting data from something that's a glitch in your program, it's really suspicious that you have one, two, three, four data points in the top right corner, mm -hmm. two, three, and four data points mm -hmm. in the bottom left, okay. and two, three, and four. Mm -hmm. This is a glitch behind the scenes. Okay. It's, not a it's not a glitch in your data. Um, it, 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 you're only getting one group coming through in 12th grade each year, and which group that is, might be white, might be Asian, mm -hmm. but Hispanics and Latinos, it, it, why would they only show up in sixth and eighth grade? 
We'll do a double check with yeah. Tim and the data and just make sure that we're not so, missing something here. But anyway, I, it's, it's but not yeah. a big one, but that one set off my, something's awry behind Thank the scenes. Thank you. Um, this is the same data that's reported <clears throat> in the grids in the report, and so uh, the data isn't in the report either. And so it's not only the data slide, but it's also the report. So, yeah, so if you remember on the data overview sheets and the written report, mm -hmm. it'll just say not available, mm -hmm. uh, just because it's not available. But yeah. well, we'll just do a double check and, and yeah. make sure. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, what were some of my other high and highs and lows? Um, now, I, I've said the important thing. I'm personally about trends. And that also, um, there were a couple of slides where we had a trend, well, there were two data points. There was one year and another year. I can't evaluate those. I don't find them useful at all. I, if at all possible, I always want to have four data points. And if there are more data points available, I want more. Um, so three is just on the verge of me not being happy. And two, just don't bother showing it to me. It just makes me grumpy. Um, which slide was that? I believe those data, those questions yeah, were only point. asked the last two years. Yeah, and you know. So I, it's the beginning of trend data that we could, that will build over yeah, time. Yeah, just show me this year's data then, because I don't, it's not a trend. It's two, two samples. Um, anyway, uh, let's see. For the avoiding substances, this is really going to be interesting. Um, I'm glad on 25 that you have the slice through the data this year and seeing the trend. I mean, yeah, of course, younger kids are using less. That's reality. Um, but it's the trends on the next slide that get me in, my attention. It's on slide 26, um, particularly in the 12th graders. I don't know that I need to see all of the other grades broken out simply because the 12th graders are sort of the worst case scenario. They're, they're the cumulative product of our pre-adults becoming adult. Here's their behavior for these risky behaviors. Um, unless there was some trend where the 10th graders were going the opposite direction of the 12th graders, I don't really need to see, this is a lot more information. So Chris, on that, just so you yeah. know, um, so I just wanna make sure process-wise, so the we built the report uh, based on the consensus agreement from the board at the study session. So I just wanna make sure that the board's knowing, so really that's feedback not now going to me or to John. This is feedback, right, that should go to the board because now Eric's gonna yeah. uh, take the lead on, on doing that report. And so I don't wanna respond yeah. to what no, you're that's, saying. That's no, that's fine, I, I mean, it's, thank you for saying that, that I, Eric did not understand your point. So, so you my point is that the, the trends in terms of drug use are, if anything, they're, they're parallel between grades. The 10th graders are going in the same direction as the 12th graders, and we get the most information from the 12th graders because they're using the most. So I don't need to see the same data four times. That's my take on this. I'm interested in the year to year, are we increasing or decreasing? I mean, I'm, I'm really gonna be interested to see what happens to vape use over the next few of these surveys because that technology is being adopted, and I, I honestly wonder if, I mean, the decrease in other illegal drugs, is that because, because we no longer consider marijuana Ill illegal, or is it because vapes are available and easy? I don't know. So, um, but it, it's, it's something where the trends, uh, I lose the trees for the forest in this case, with seeing too many data points where really they're all telling us the same thing that there is a trend towards decreasing overall substance use among our students. It's just this most most visible in our 12th graders, and that's the group where I worry about the most heavily. I mean, I, I don't wanna say, don't show us the previous slide, because I like seeing that from sixth to eighth to 10th to 12th. If our sixth graders were using as heavily as our 12th graders, that's a problem. That would be major warning bells. But as it is, that sort of confirms that that trend is there. Okay, great, now let's look at the 12th graders. That's the most significant outcome. That's my take on these data. I'm going to back up for just a second and say, knowing that you have the information that was recorded from the last study session to put the, into this alleviates my previous concern. Okay. Uh, Chris? Yeah. You make a strong point. I just, I'll tell you my, re my gut reaction yeah. to that was that I, I do... I mean, I think it is 
the, the earlier kids start are using drugs, the presumably the worse it is for them. Yes. And I, I, yes, looking at this slide right here, I would agree it's not telling us much of anything. It's, well, but, it's telling us the but, same but, thing but each it, time. It could, it, but it yeah. could have. It could have, yes. So, okay, is that, so wouldn't that be a reason for having that be part of the presentation? I, that's and why, if not, question. why not? Yeah, I, well, it's, it's something where um, I'm looking at it from the executive perspective of, I'd like someone to look at it, but as long as they're all trending in the same direction, I don't need to see all of the four different graphs that show the same thing. Um, there was another slide here where it had like four different questions all addressing the same point. Off, I don't need to see all of the data if it's a consistent story. Um, but And that's something that we've, we've historically been pretty good at in the reports is flagging something as here's something we're actually worrying about. Yeah. So it would definitely be something where I'd be interested in having someone else check it out. But if it's telling us the same story, I don't need to see all that, four of these. Okay. So. Um, I agree with Chris now. There's two of you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I'll, I'll just note that in here. You yeah. might want to con continue that offline. If there's, yeah. If, as you start writing a report, okay. if you have yeah, any we'll questions, try. give Chris a holler. Uh, anything else on this uh, issue on the ER3? The last one I would like to pull out for conversation is on slide 29. Um, this is fascinating to me. Um, with the boys from 6th through 12th, we are having a gap, although honestly in 8th grade, 8th grade girls are more active than 10th grade boys. So it's 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 a trend where they're going to decreasing levels uh, in a similar trend. But the percent of students participating in activities, so on the right graph, now we've in inverted that. So we've now got about a 10 point difference between the boys and girls with girls participating in more activities. Is this, uh, is, is sports included as activities? No, sports, sports is a different indicator. So. Uh, and we have that called out differently here. Yeah. So this, if you remember at the study session, you had the yeah. sheet that said, here's the actual question that's asked on the Healthy Youth Survey. Yeah. And so this is asking about activities, uh, clubs, church activities. It's not just school activities, mm -hmm. remember. And um, so it's, it's not athletics. Athletics is a different question. And I believe it actually specifically calls out not athletics, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Right. So in the written report, uh, just specifically the question, um, how many, and again, it's a different question for six versus mm -hmm. grades eight mm -hmm. through 12. Um, sixth graders are being asked, how many times in the past year 12 months, have you participated in clubs, organizations, or activities at school? So the sixth grade data is at school data. Grades eight through 12 are being asked, during the average week on how many days do you participate in supervised after school activities, either at school or away from school, <laughs> include activities such as, so mm -hmm. sports, sorry, yeah. <laughs> art, one. music, dance, drama, or community service, religion, religious or club activities. Mm -hmm. So it could be club sports versus district right. athletics. Yeah. So that's the differentiator. Anyway, this, this was fascinating to me because it's, it's a pretty significant gap, 10 percentage points. Um, and, you know, trying to address it in Title IX, what, what made me wonder is, is, is the gap just because there's only so many hours in the day? If you've got kids who are already participating in a bunch of non-athletic activities, is that simply precluding them from participating in the physically active side? Mm -hmm. um, and and the, on this slide, and John, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the the one is physically active, uh, which may be physically active in any sort of way. Maybe I walk to school. If I recall um, the question, it, it was one it hour a day. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. have to necessarily right. it's a high bar, mean actually. athletics, yeah. high right, bar. or yeah. district athletics. Yeah. There's the different piece of data that we were able to pull out of our student information system in terms of the mm -hmm. percentage of students who participate in district athletics, which is where the whole like Title IX piece would right. come into play. Yeah. 
So anyway, I, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by these. I, I appreciate the challenges of addressing Title IX. I'm glad that you are thinking down that road. And just, I, I would love to see more analysis behind where's this gap coming from. Um, this is something I would, uh, I'm behind digging deeper. Tell us more about this story. Um, it, it might be interesting to see in the, uh, where were we, the activities notes. Can we go back one slide, I think? Nope, never mind. Uh, participating in participating in activities, if the if you have, if it's the male-female difference between the two in the 12th grade, are you seeing an inverse uh, number trend academically? So you have, uh, let's uh, perhaps less activities, less participation in activities, especially sports activities, is that is that trend, is that inverse to their academic performance for the girls? I don't know. This is healthy. Sorry. This is healthy youth data, right? Yeah. Um, and that's uh, anonymized, so we can't link it back to okay. academics. But do they self-report anything on academics? I don't know. Uh, I don't. I off the top of my head, I don't think there's. Yeah. I, mean, I don't there recall might be some such a thing. Yeah. Academic. Yeah. Questions. So, but, I mean, I agree with you, Mark. That yeah. would be cool. I just don't yeah, I, think I don't they know can if do it's it. Possible. Yeah. I just mm -hmm. thought I'd bring it up because I was mm -hmm. trying to, I too was trying to figure out a reason for the gap. Yeah. And I, that was the only thing I could come to, to be mm -hmm. quite frank, off the top of my head in two minutes or less. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Any more comments? Now I'm done. And is uh, there anything clear as mud for you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, if anyone has any additional thoughts, Feel free to email them to me too. I will not put this together until the weekend. Okay. At the right. absolute earliest. Okay, our next agenda item is program reports. Dr. Pierce. Great, all right. So um, we have a program report tonight and a superintendent report tonight. And uh, realizing the time, just, you know, we'll, we'll go quickly on the program report. These are designed to be 10 minutes or less. Uh, these uh, first, we started this process last year, so a lot of the information is similar to what you saw last year. It's just sort of an update, and um, we'll highlight uh, any you know significant changes and so forth. But uh, the first program report, Matt will uh, help walk us through here. It is just an update on our STEM efforts uh, district wide. So go ahead, Matt. We'll skip a few, some of these that they've seen before. Um, but this is our attempt to just make a clear connection uh, and dig in a little deeper. For example, we do an ER report on math and science. Uh, and it, sometimes in those ER reports, we talk about, as you know, you know, touch on programs that we have. Uh, and we don't really have an opportunity to go very in depth. So these are that opportunity to go a little more in depth. Uh, and so go ahead, Matt, and you can go quickly through some of the parts that I will. Thank you. You've seen, we've seen uh, before. Good evening. It's great to be with you. I want to start by not being remiss in thanking Mike Van Orden, who's our assistant associate superintendent for student academic success services and his team who helped pull a lot of this information together and did the legwork. So thank you, Mike. We start with what is STEM. Six years ago, our district uh, defined kind of a vision for STEM. I highlighted for you some of the key words that I wanted to focus on. That's the teaching and learning results of solving real world problems involving collaboration and partnership with the purpose of building a better future. Some of the calls for were that students would explore STEM related professions related to their interest. There was equity of access, foundational knowledge that is across disciplines and that students get a very important opportunity to, to present their work to demonstrate what they've done. Here are some of our current STEM efforts at every level, starting with elementary, where students are spending between 10 and 12 hours in science and math. Our core materials have been uh, FOSS science and Envision math, and you can see the supporting resources there. One of the exciting things is that we've begun a case five um, science adoption process this year with our research and development year. This is the year they're looking at both standards and best practice. One of the exciting things, and you will see it there in the slide, is that many of the new curricula have STEM strands built in, as in engineering and FOSS, shown there on the lower right. Why I say that is that our older curriculum didn't have as strong a STEM presence, and the newest curriculum is bringing in those 
threads, which is very critical. Second piece I wanna mention is the new STEM choice program at Mead, which is expanding from 75 to 150 students. So there'll be more opportunities for students to be involved in that. I also wanna mention something that was highlighted in a recent uh, board briefs from uh, Dr. Pierce, and it's the innovation programs that uh, are being highlighted uh, for just beginning underway. I wanna highlight just a few of them. One of them is the Creating Innovators at Sandberg and Discovery, the elementary STEM symposium that you may have read about with three of our elementary schools in Lake Washington, a math community at Redmond Elementary, Einstein's Pale, which is passionate about learning, which is about problem solving, and the, and the elementary computer science leadership program those are also three elementaries coming together. So this is just an example of some of the innovative programs that are very directly related to STEM. We also have before and after school programs in addition to the ones I mentioned. You see the students involved there in an hour of code, which is not only at Alcott, but a number of our elementary schools. And there's science and math programs, technology, engineering. And I wanna move now to middle school. So middle school has uh, t approximately, students are engaged in 10 hours of science and math each week. Uh, the integrated science uh, is relatively new as well as the new math curriculum. Uh, you can see the core materials are highlighted there. STEM in middle school math curriculum involves application of concepts. It's back to the real world situations that I mentioned in the opening of our definition. These are the range of STEM electives offered across all of our middle schools. They vary depending on the school, and yet the thing I can say is consistent across the system is that the expansion of electives has been happening in all of our middle schools. At the high school level, students are required to have three years of science and four years of math in order to graduate. We also have STEM signature courses and programs, which I'll highlight in a moment earlier. Dr. Pierce mentioned that CTE is the place where we do have many of our STEM courses and offerings, and then again, WANIC. Here is STEM in our high school biology curriculum, where again, they're using real world lab technology and procedures through virtual labs. Many more STEM electives that are occurring at all of our high schools. And our STEM signature courses and programs, which we began in that 12, 2012 year uh, are still occurring. They've uh, morphed and they've varied over the years. Uh, they've evolved, but you can see there at all of our high schools are offering unique interdisciplinary programs that involve problem-based learning, real-world exploration of, of problems that students are trying to solve. I'm gonna skip this slide because I now wish that I had reversed it and started with a higher level, so I'm gonna just give you the higher level first. Across the board, when we compare ourselves comparably to state and national pass rates, we are exceeding all of these, in all of these areas uh, to, to a pretty high degree. When we look within our own system over the last four years, there's three different kinds of variation that I'm noticing, and I wanna get to the right slide here, because I was making some notes. In an example like biology, where you started four years ago with a 93% pass rate, dips to 81, then 84, then back up to 90, it's called that started high, dipped, went back up. There's one pattern going on there. There's a second pattern, like computer science A, where we started four years ago at 85% pass rate, and we're at 92%, where there's been a steady, progressive trend upward. And there's a third pattern, which is a declining one, like statistics, which is concerning and it's an opportunity to go to ask what's happening that it went 74 to 67 over four years. One of the things that I've had some preliminary discussion with our director of accelerated programs on is how could we work with the college board which administers the accelerated program tests to better understand how a district when we look at how we're doing nationally and against the state what could we do with our data to see opportunities to better understand what is this telling us? Because this is at such a global level. We're looking at not just an individual school, we're looking at the whole system. So one of the things we wanna take as a sort of next steps is when we see a pattern where you start high, dip, jump back up, what is that telling us and how should we be interpreting that? 
and I think College Board is gonna give us, the, they have resources now on, on how to analyze the results and what you could do with them, and I wanna explore that further. One thing to point out quickly too, you probably noticed the chart on the right where we also track uh, the number of students attempting the exam mm -hmm. each year. So statistics is an interesting one because that number has grown from 128 students attempting in 2014 to 186 students attempting in 2017, which is great. Whereas However, biology as went Matt from highlighted though, 244 to 229 students. So. Mm -hmm. And again. it peaked a little in 2016. Mm -hmm. I was highlighting statistics because that would be something for us to potentially look at is that, that we've got more students attempting, right. uh, not as right. many students passing. Yes. Yeah. Anecdotally, um, when kids don't want to take the second year of AP calculus, they tend to go for AP statistics. So I don't know if they're mm -hmm. looking for that other AP mm -hmm. class to fill out their resume. And that's why we're seeing an increase. You might, I don't know how you would measure that, but yep. that's the word in the street. Finally, I want to highlight some of the partnerships that we have in STEM. Uh, over the years, we have formed some pretty strong partnerships with four particular areas, starting with our Washington Alliance for Better Schools, where we offer uh, STEM summer externships and have been now for the last several years. Uh, our ambitious science teaching project through the University of Washington, which is uh, partnering with them to help train our middle school teachers uh, in ambitious science teaching. The Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle and the Math and Science Fellows with the Puget Sound Educational Service District. This is truly a, a great partnership of using combination of both university and industry experts to help us make sure we're on the right track with where we're going with STEM and STEM knowledge for our teachers. And that is under 10 minutes, so thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, and Tracy, your superintendent's report? Yep, so uh, I'm gonna get a little assistance on this one as well. And uh, we're gonna be able to go quickly on this one too. This is our annual update in terms of student services. And uh, m much of what's included here is some healthy youth survey data. So uh, it's duplicating uh, what much of what you saw in ER3, so we will not repeat ourselves. It was just interesting that since this is the first year we've done ER3, uh, we haven't had this issue come up in the past. But what uh, we do want to, and I think it's timely because of uh, our uh, national uh, school counseling week, uh, really highlight in student services uh, what um, the department focuses on. So it focuses on providing programs and services to support student academic success, safety, and social emotional well-being. Again, some of the program efforts that are reflected in the ER report really are uh, efforts that uh, student services lead. So we won't bore you with uh, repetitive information. We do wanna highlight tonight, if you think about all the programs and services that are part of student services, it's our counseling program, our uh, anti-harassment, intimidation, and bullying efforts, Efforts, student discipline, athletics and activities, and attendance. Tonight we're just going to hone in on some of our K-12 counseling services and we'll highlight any of the um, Healthy Youth Survey data that might not have been included in ER3 and we'll make this one go quickly as well. Like Dr. Pierce said, we are going to highlight the role of the counselor tonight um, uh, in this report. And so, you know, what does a counselor do? They really personalize uh, education and supports. They promote and enhance academic, personal, social, and career development for all students. And they really do follow a national model. That model is called ASCA. Uh, and all of our uh, counselors know that model, they understand that model, and they implement that model at both elementary and secondary schools. And ask us the American School so, Counseling Association, I think. It is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, we have a full-time counselor at all of our elementary schools, and the things they do on a day-to-day -day basis, they're identifying um, ways to enhance student access to learning opportunities, uh, they're advocates for our students, and they do offer school-wide instruction in social-emotional learning. Our secondary service model differs uh, in that they're providing both academic and career guidance for students. Uh, they do offer support for individual students uh, navigating both educational and social landscapes. 
They provide targeted support for underrepresented student groups. That's uh, our college bound students, ensuring that our students have uh, uh, completed their application by the end of eighth grade. And then we actually provide ongoing support in high school for those students uh, to make sure that they complete all of the different requirements so that at the end of their, uh, uh, after they're graduated, they are able to go on to college. Um, they also assist in the referral for social, emotional, and or mental health supports. In uh, talking about our social, emotional supports uh, at, our, uh, at our schools, um, Social emotional learning is critical for all of our students. Um, Washington State is in the process right now of adopting benchmarks for our K-12 students. We currently have social emotional and climate curriculum in our schools. We also know that there's areas that we want to highlight. Uh, we do have second step now at all of our elementary schools. That started uh, as um, a program that about half of our elementary schools uh, had in place through a partnership with University of Washington. Uh, earlier this, this evening, we talked about really looking at social emotional learning curriculum for uh, the middle schools. And you can see here some of the other efforts as well. Uh, some of our healthy use survey data, uh, just to point out a few items here. Uh, this is the lowest reporting of bullying to date for, uh, for our students. Uh, it's lower than state averages. Uh, our students are reporting that they feel safe at school. We're seeing reports of less weapons, less fighting, and our students are also reporting um, uh, lots of opportunities to be involved in school activities. Another part of our uh, program is uh, suicide prevention. And in uh, April 2013, uh, state legislature passed a bill requiring that school districts adopt a, a suicide prevention plan. And that really was um, training for recognition, making sure there was a process for initial screening, and then a, a response. To, uh, to those challenges. And so looking at our healthy use survey, uh, it's compelling when 18% um, of our, high, our seniors uh, let us know that they've considered attempting suicide, that 16% of our seniors have made a plan around suicide, and that 8% of our students are reporting that they have attempted suicide. So it is critical that we have plans in place, processes in place to be able to respond to our students in need. Part of that recognition is training for staff. And so as a counselor, nurse, psychologist, or occupational therapist or physical therapist, to be certified, they have to go through training um, around suicide prevention. Um, additionally, we've provided training for our building administrators and certificated staff around recognition and reporting because it, we have a, a team of people at the school that know what to do when they receive a report, but they're not the ones that are interacting on a day-to-day -day basis with students. If a teacher uh, recognizes and notices students in distress, it is their duty and responsibility to report that so that we can implement the plan. And part of this is also around drug and alcohol prevention and intervention. And if you think about the different levels of supports in place, we have universal supports for all of our students, selective supports for students that are at risk, and indicative supports for our students that are at high risk. And the service model really is wraparound support for all of our students. I think the bullet that's missing here is our, our teaching staff because they're the ones that on a day-to-day -day basis are seeing the students and actually referring and providing um, that necessary recognition. But our guidance counselors um, understand the early intervention and referral process, our partnerships with youth, youth Eastside services around chemical dependency. Uh, they provide dual certified staff for us to provide both mental health and chemical dependency support. And they also provide our risk assessments when a student is identifying uh, self-harm. We also have uh, contract and support through Evergreen Health, having social workers at our four comprehensive high schools. And so when you think about the universal supports in place, it's mental health and chemical dependency, uh, 
in substance abuse education, which is embedded at both the middle school and high school levels. And each of our secondary schools does receive support from uh, a contracted provider. On the right, you see a map, and that map is when a student's in crisis, what are the steps we take uh, to be able to evaluate uh, whether or not the student needs a different level of support, such as a risk assessment or ongoing counseling. And so uh, these are the steps our schools take to be able to respond to a student who's at risk. For our students that are identifying that they're at risk, uh, we might engage them in small group supports run by uh, Youth Eastside Services, uh, our guidance counselors, or our social workers. And if students have expressed suicidal ideation or self-harm, uh, or if they're in possession um, or have been using drugs or alcohol on campus, they are referred to YES or our Evergreen Health counselors for a risk screening. And that risk screening uh, applies directly to that process of determining what level of risk our students are at. And then our students that are at most risk. Uh, we have processes in place to be able to provide uh, just-in-time or real-time assessments of those students so that if they are presenting high risk of self-harm, that they get the support they need immediately and it isn't delayed. And so those supports are in place at all of our schools and uh, we couldn't do that without our local agencies providing those supports and really working with us around the needs of our schools and our students. It's also important to point out that uh, we have students that aren't able to access private support, and so working with our community agencies and providers uh, to identify those supports needed, there's times where they'll, they'll come into our schools to provide that support for students. And so uh, these are the data you saw earlier this evening around um, substance abuse uh, or avoidance of substance abuse. Uh, So quick question, it's fantastic we have all of these outside partners that are willing to work with us to help our kids. Do we have any idea when somebody isn't at the highest risk if they're actually accessing the services that we refer them to? If they're the services that are in school, yes, because we're knowing whether or not they're going to a group or one-on-one -on -one and things like that. Um, if it's outside, it's really our partnership communication with families uh, because we're not taking the students to those services. So are all of those um, YES and Evergreen Health, are they coming into our schools on a regular basis just for high risk? Um, so, so YES provides services around high risk um, assessments and evaluation. They also provide our chemical dependency supports. So there's times where uh, a student's identified as at risk and they may be, were using or in possession on campus and they may be an in-house or in-school suspension. And so we're actually providing um, during that in-school suspension time uh, prevention support for those students. So Cassandra, I'm not sure if this was the question, but we, we don't just bring them in when there's a student at risk situation, each of the schools has a certain number of hours from a YES specialist who actually works at the school on a regular basis. Same with the um, Evergreen Health social workers, they're 0.5 um, at the comprehensive high school. So they're there to uh, sort of do the, you know, day-to-day -day kind of supports and work with students. And they're there when we need them for the high risk kind of emergency I'm type situation. I'm glad to hear that. That was, I guess, the basis of my question that I didn't really ask very well. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the report. Thank you for the uh, update on. <laughs> At this point, uh, Eric, do you have anything on legislative? Uh, update to report. I know that uh, Siri yeah. is in DC at this point, so we'll probably hear more next time around. But go ahead. Uh, sure. Yes. Um, hold on. So let's see here. 
I think we had a board meeting since the legislature passed the capital for capital budget. I don't recall if we did or not. But at any rate, I, uh, hopefully everyone knows by now that the legislature finally passed the capital budget. Um, I have not heard anything whether, there was concerns there may be a backlog of, since it was not passed for a while. I haven't heard anything about that being an issue. I don't know, Tracy, have you heard anything in terms of from OSPI or any? Uh, no, I can get an update. We, we're not experiencing any immediate right. backlogs because of that. Uh, we just think it could be a, an issue moving forward, but I can uh, see if we can get any more detailed update on that. So in terms of what the legislature is doing now, um, tomorrow is the cutoff for bills to be passed out of a uh, fiscal committee. So there are some interesting bills still pending, including one um, that would reduce the passage or reduce the required passage rate for school uh, bond elections from 60% to 55%. That has not yet been passed out of the, yes. Yeah, 55, still a sort of extra majority requirement that they would be <laughs> better than 60. So that remains um, in the Senate Ways and Means Committee. Uh, in our, for our district, both uh, state senators for the 45th and the first are on that committee. So um, if you, tomorrow is the deadline for it to be passed out of the committee. So if you have time tonight to shoot one or both of them an email, that would be terrific. Um, in terms of, as far as education bills go, the, the bills that are most being discussed are two, or several what's called McCleary fixes. I should put my air quotes up there. Um, so, uh, one, one bill is provides a, a number of different sort of fine tunes to what it was passed last year. Uh, including increasing special education funding and a few other different fine tunes. Mm -hmm. uh, another proposal being, or bill being discussed would be to, is Jay Inslee's proposal to increase, dramatically increase again the funding. So uh, those are still getting kicked back and forth. I don't have any feel one way or another how that will work out. Um, but I will know more soon. Because it's a short session, Everything is moving rather quickly. Uh, I suppose my question for the board is, um, so I've been doing my best to try to track and read as much as I can. What would be, what would be helpful for the board uh, to, to hear from me uh, in terms of being able to act upon what we're hearing from the legislature? Would it be just action items, any, any sort of daily update? What would the board be interested in he hearing? I think it's not only Nothing that, is I think also it's not, not only the action updates, but it's also the idea of what are we hearing, what are we seeing that uh, if since it is a short session, what's in, within the realm of possibility, what's uh, nice wish list, but yet let's get real folks, sort of a thing, sure. um, and some of it may be peripheral as well. Um, there's a, a bill that's co-authored by uh, uh, Representative McBride uh, on. Uh, cutting down on the uh, number of fakes uh, or uh, appearing ser uh, service animals that are not real service animals uh, to make sure that, that we aren't uh, having peacocks running up and down the hall like they had at United Airlines. Um, uh, but anything that's pr that has an impact on education, I think we sometimes we do narrowly, too narrowly focus on, on something that's only going to happen within a school wall, but I think it's the idea of what could have an impact on uh, education or what could have an impact on our kids? Mark. So Eric, Mike, if there are things where action is urgent or whatever, just lead with those suckers. Because um, occasionally there's gonna be things where, and it's not gonna be very often, but you'll find out something where it's like, oh God, we've gotta lean on somebody and they happen to be someone we might know. Um, to talk them into voting for something. That's the highest priority. Um, the second priority is things that seem to have significant support, for better or for worse. If it hasn't made it out of committee yet, um, it's still vaporware. Um, they, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of good ideas and an awful lot of really bad ideas die in committee. Um, so that's sort of the tertiary level. It's, if it's made it out of committee and it's moving, then those are the, most, the, the second tier. Um, but uh, it's, it, 
you've got your, you, you, I trust your judgment. I mean, you, you, if you find things that you're like, gosh, everybody's got to hear about this, always bring those to us. But no, we don't need daily updates or whatever. I mean, it's it's legislation. Sausage making is only so much fun to watch. Good. Eric, to be quite frank, if there's something all of a sudden that we need to t talk to folks about and it's two weeks to a meeting, yeah, just, uh, just call us. Sure, of course. Hex, just whatever. I mean, uh, so we can organize an effort. Uh, I I hate to stand on the formalities of a meeting yeah. to wait for yeah. legislation. God knows the world doesn't wait on us. <laughs> we will follow the Open Meetings Act, though. <laughs> okay, that's it. Okay. Uh, any board follow up? Going once. Thank you on the ER3. That is not an easy one. It's a work in progress, and that's a fine first draft. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And good luck to Eric in uh, trying to distill it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just couldn't avoid that. Yeah. Uh, any future agenda items? I got nothing. Okay. Well, uh, oh. I don't know if we formally put this on the, I mean, we are going to be discussing the science ER yes. two, One, three yes. at the next. Yes. Uh, let's see. Uh, any debriefing? Uh, I might suggest that since we, as we found during the healthy use survey, there seemed to be a bit of a gap of our knowledge on vaping, that perhaps we might be looking at a briefing in the near future or of uh, what is vaping, what isn't vaping, uh, with the idea of what substances can be and can't be. Uh, to be quite frank, I would assume that any drug that can be burned could be vaped. I don't know. I, it, it's really ironic, but Mark's dead on. We need a little I, bit of drug education for the board. I actually agree. I have no idea what any of that is. So. <laughs> I mean, for those of us that had a rather interesting adolescence, but it's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Any board comments? Okay, seeing none. Uh, let's see, we have the upcoming schedule of our next board meeting will be held on March 5th uh, at 5 p.m. The study session, the topic uh, a review of EL2, emergency CEO secession. Tracy, drive carefully in the next week. Uh, EL4, uh, annual report and district calendar. EL13, facilities and special education action plan update. Uh, the location will be the Hughes Room. Yes, Tracy? Can I make a quick comment? Mm -hmm. Just to remind everybody, so the e ELs have not typically been in a study session. However, last March, the board asked that 10 minutes be carved out of the study session on the evening that the ELs would be uh, presented, and they typically go in consent agenda unless there's areas of non-compliance uh, in case the board wanted to talk about anything. So that's why those ELs, I just wanted to remind everybody because it is an unusual thing, it's a new thing, and, and it's there because the board said that they wanted it there. So really the main topic of the study session is special education. Okay. We'll limit the, yeah. the EL discussion to the 10 minutes that the board said. Okay, great. So I would encourage any and all of the parents who are interested in special education to attend the uh, uh, study session. Uh, also, then the, then the board meeting, full board meeting will show up at 7 o'clock and in the board room. I now entertain a motion for, to adjourn. So moved. Second. Uh, it's been moved by uh, Eric Liberty to uh, adjourn. It's been seconded by Chris uh, Carlson, that we adjourn. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. Hearing none, motion carries. Adios.